Oh, are you trying to sleep up behind me? I'm just trying to say goodbye. I won't see you. Oh, that's right. I was thinking you were going to be here today. Today is my last day. Yeah. And I don't Bummed out. I'm not a happy camper. I'm not ready to go home. But you're going to go back to that nice warm country. Well, according to Mike, he said it's going to be in the 70s. Oh, that's Well, is it? They're 70 and our 70 are two different. Yeah, that's true. Their 70 feels like our 55. Oh, I'd be able to handle 55. No, no, no. I mean, 70 and 70 is 55 or 70, so I meant that I, I could handle the I could handle the 70. Here I can handle the 55. Uh, anyway. Please don't put patch on the back. Just don't put that on the back. Big jam. You need direction. <laughs> hey, you can't put hats on the bears. You can't put a hat on the bear. No, not in church. It's warming. It's warming off in here. <laughs> Yeah, and often. Yeah. 
It's all right. So then, yeah. That's the one. <laughs> so it doesn't. No, no, no. It doesn't. <laughs> I guess I can plug this in. I talked to Paul. One, two, three.
Well, good morning. Welcome to Desert Chapel. Welcome to this beautiful weather. And uh, I see several people must have left us this past week to go back where it's maybe not quite as beautiful. A um, couple of things. We're going to have a, a short meeting of the leadership board right after church to uh, finalize what we're going to do as far as cleaning up the buildings and grounds around, or the grounds at, the, at this point. And I want to thank you for your generosity. Last week we got about 25% to our goal um, to try to get, the, uh, get a, a company in here to do the initial cleanup. So if any of you haven't been able to give anything and can put some funds in for this morning, we'll be making a decision about what we need to do there. I know there are two or three people that have let me know that they will donate as well that may or may not be here this morning, but we're going to count it real quick. We're going to have a meeting and then we'll get on with uh, cleaning the out. We are going to clean it up one way or the other <laughs> and it needs it. So um, Peggy Cabrina is going to um, have a six week, six week long women in the Bible, Bible study class. And it'll begin this Thursday, so that's May 11th, at 10.30 a.m. at Peggy's house. So, Peggy, where are you? Oh, she's right over there. Stand up if you would like to go to that Bible. And it's for men, too, men to study the women. I mean, we've been doing that for a long time, and we haven't figured it out yet. So maybe, maybe that will <laughs> Peggy's going to help us with that. But consider the source. Well, the source is the Bible, though, right? So it should be. Okay, we'll do that. Be careful here. I know. I'm getting into, ground there. <laughs> getting into deep water here. Yeah, I'll stop while I'm ahead. So, and the leadership board is going to meet on um, Wednesday, and we've got lots of things to consider. Um, how we're going to, uh, to welcome our new pastor and maybe send off our old one, or not old, I mean our current one. <laughs> I'm having trouble this morning. I think I need to quit. So, uh, Pastor, do you have anything to announce? All right. Michael. Is it birthdays and anniversaries? Oh, we can do that. All right. First Sunday. Any May birthdays besides mine? Okay. Greta's not here. Okay. Everybody sing happy birthday to me. That last note did it, didn't it? <laughs> How about anniversaries? Anybody have an anniversary in May? It's kind of a light month, huh? Nobody? Pardon? Oh, yeah, online. Janine's, okay. Well, then we need to do that. Janine and Dwayne.
I do have one thing to say. When I came here, I had no idea what the anniversary song was. So you have to teach it to the new pastor, right? Teach him the words. Because I had no idea and I'd never heard it before. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's his first week. And I felt rather uh, strange not knowing the words. Okay. Michael's going to regale us with Here I Am, Lord. Uh, this, I should mention, is sung at annual conference every year by all the clergy. Um, it's a song of surrender, basically. Here, I'm yours, Lord. Here I am. So, uh, it, <laughs> I cry every time I hear it. <laughs> Go ahead, Michael. Thank you.
Fabulous, fabulous, Michael, thank you. If you can comfortably do so, please stand for the call to worship. Come and sit with me, we shall study the word. Together we shall read and understand. Come and kneel with me, we shall break the bread. Together we shall eat and be satisfied. Come and walk with me, we shall part the waters. Together we shall risk, and behold, we shall be changed. Our opening hymn this morning is number 2149 out of the little tiny book, Living for Jesus, verses 1, 2, and 3. <laughs> Who stole my pencil? There it is. Um, we are asked to pray today and forward from here for Al Pajak. 
Pastor Sharon's husband has been diagnosed with Parkinson's. And uh, I don't know if you know, if you heard the news lately, there is a new treatment for Parkinson's which doesn't cure it, but it can substantially slow the treatment or the progression of the disease, this new treatment. So let's pray that Al gets the treatment he needs. Ryan? Just want to mention, in spite of the diagnosis, he ran a half marathon this past week. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, it, you know, it's, it's quite surprising. I've seen people who've been diagnosed with the disease but really don't show any outward signs that you would notice and can do things like that for some months before it progresses to a point where it becomes debilitating. And uh, let's pray for Al to continue to have the spirit to do things like that and to be involved and pray for Sharon also. Because as my wife says, when the husband's ill, the wife takes the brunt of it. Yes, dear? <laughs> so, nodding her head furiously back there. <laughs> um, the other prayer requests are more global. Um, the Sudan is, as you've heard, is undergoing a, basically a civil war and a lot of people are trying to get out of there, particularly non-Sudanese people, but also some of the Sudanese. They're going to Egypt, which is, in my mind, almost out of the frying pan into the fire. Egypt is not a good place to be right now. Um, but they're also trying to get to Saudi Arabia and other places in Africa. But uh, we need to play, pray for the people of Sudan. Also, you may have heard um, about the shooting in Texas yesterday. Something like eight people killed, nine people injured. Uh, unfortunately, the gunman did not survive. Uh, a police officer who was there at the mall where the shooting took place was called for there for some other reason. And as he arrived, he realized what was going on and was able to take down the gunman. Um, You know, Texas is a little bit of a different state. If you've ever lived there, the people are very self-secure se self and like to take care of things themselves. And I just feel sorry for them that this has happened in their community. The community is called Allen, Texas. It's just north of the Dallas-Fort Worth area. There was this morning yet another wrong way driving accident on the freeway in Phoenix. We were talking, my wife and I were talking about a solution that <coughs> we heard of some time ago, but it's never been implemented. But it's going to have to be soon. This is just ridiculous. People either um, intoxicated or uh, so confused that they don't know what they're doing. Um, we had a, an incident come close to us. In fact, our next door neighbor some years ago, the daughter was killed by a wrong way driver. Um, the lady had got out of a secure facility um, and was suffering from some mental disease and uh, got on the 101 and drove the wrong way. And this young girl who was 17, 18, had been working a night shift and on her way home, was, she was involved in a fatal accident. And you know, it's, it's terrible when young lives are taken away. I've never seen so many young people in a church. I performed the, the funeral service for that young lady. It's about 15, 20 years ago now. And Never seen a church so packed with young people. They turned out from all over the all over the state and beyond for this young girl. 
Wrong way drivers are a serious problem. Do you know what to do if you see a, someone coming to you on the wrong lane of the freeway? It's hard to figure out what, where do I go? Do I go left? Do I go right? Do I stop? It's something you know we all need to learn and to be aware of. Because it, it can happen even on an ordinary road, not just on a freeway, but we just we hear, hear about it on the freeway because that's usually when the, the impact is at its, its highest. Most damage is done. Driving lessons next week. These are the things that are on some of our hearts today. I also want to remember those who were here last week and now are on the way to cooler climates. They'll learn. <laughs> but now let's say a prayer for them also to bless them as they are back home. Um, they continue to remember us here and we hope to see them next year. Let us spend some time in quiet prayer the things that are on our hearts and minds. Amen. You pray the pr prayer of the people with me. O Lord of the broken chain, the people of your earth seek their freedom. We kneel in the night, breathless runaways, breathing the silent prayer of the prayed upon. O God of the North Star, we shall not be able to find our way unless someone guides us. Bend us and lift our chins. Eyes to the brilliant light in the sky, that we may have a beacon on which to fix our hope. We have dared to stumble away from slave row, but unless you lead us, O oh Lord, we can go no further. Amen. Today's scripture comes from the 14th chapter of John, verses 1 through 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself so that where I am, there you may also be. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my father also. From now on, you do not know him and have seen him. Excuse me, from now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, I have been with you all this time, Philip, and you do not still know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does this, his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, 
then believe because of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and, in fact, will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. Please stand, if you can comfortably do so, to hymn number 536, Precious Name, verses 1, 2, and 3. for one of the uh, talk show hosts on one radio station. Let not your hearts be troubled. This man, by the way, is a Christian, albeit Catholic, but that's okay. Uh, he, he, always, he states this program many times, states this phrase many times during his program. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God and believe also in me. And I've, I've always been fascinated by this phrase since I was a choir boy. Um, in my father's house are many mansions. And I thought, that's strange. What do you have of a mansion in a house? Because my idea of a house was two up and down with an outback because um, that's what I was raised with and I thought how can you get many mansions in there but then as I started to explore the idea of translation what scripture means I thought no there are then I found this translation there are many dwelling places okay everybody's got their own room and then Jesus says, but if it were not so, I would have told you. So what, what is he really getting at here? And I, I think, you know, 
John spent too many words. All he could say is, all he should have said is, in my father's house there's room for everybody. You know, because that's what he's saying, really. But, you know, why use 25 words when you can use five? This part of John's Gospel is where we see the difference between the three what we call the synoptic Gospels, or the ones that are pretty much the same story told in a different way, and John's Gospel, which is tells the same story, but in a different order, with different sequence, and with lots of different stuff in it. It becomes clear in John's Gospel, particularly when we begin to read the I am statements. I think there are 14 or 15 of these statements where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the light. I am the true vine. You remember all of those? You don't find those in other in the other Gospels, not in the same way. There are also some different parables not seen in the other Gospels. So what's John's story? Well, for one thing, John is writing after the other Gospels are already written. John's Gospel is probably not completed until about 90 AD. Now, you might say, well, how old was this John? Well, you remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, there's a story of when the temple guard come to arrest Jesus, that this young man runs away and somebody, one of the guards grabs his robe and it comes off. So he's essentially the first streaker. And it's thought to probably have been John. And he was a teenager, basically. So in 30 AD, he's a teenager, so this comes out 70 years later. Unusual for someone to live that long, but not impossible. So that's one theory about who John is and where he came from. So he essentially, he had followed Jesus for all these years. John, as we know, ends up on the island of Patmos um, off the coast of Turkey and in a cave on top of a hill. And believe me, if it is the one that they take the tourists to, it's quite a walk up there. Uh, not something you'd want to do every day. In fact, when I was there with the last tour group I took over there, we had some teenagers with us, older teenagers, as part of a whole family that went. And this one lady dearly wanted to go to see the cave where John had written his works. And she said, I can't climb that. <laughs> some of us younger ones will look at it and say, I'm not sure I want to climb that either. Anyway, two of these young men came along and made a chair. I don't know if you've ever done it with two arms and then one arm on the back. And they carried this lady up to that cave. And it's quite, quite spontaneously. I mean, no one had to ask them. Or, and I thought, they're good kids. They saw a need and they fulfilled it with Christian spirit. And... John, sitting up there for years, writing this gospel from a completely different viewpoint to the others, doesn't even follow the same pattern. I mean, the, the opening lines are Old Testament. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. That is, <laughs> Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't write like that. <laughs> this is a completely different 
beginning. And it, John's Gospel relies heavily on the Old Testament. Because let's face it, who is, he, who is he writing to? He's writing basically to a people who have been raised on the Old Testament and understand it. They knew their Old Testament. They understood the message of the Old Testament and realized the significance of the Jesus story. It for, the Jesus story fulfills the promise of the Old Testament. In order to understand Jesus in the first century of the common era, as it's now called, you have to understand the promises that were made during Old Testament times. John's Gospel appeared in, as I said, in the last decade of the, uh, the first century and is revealed, in its relevant rather, to both Christians and Jews. It, has, it becomes more relevant after the events of Easter. And people begin to say, oh, yes, now I understand. Those who wanted to believe in the risen Christ saw and heard that the resurrection had indeed happened. Jesus was alive and was seen by many, not only apostles, but a lot of others too. I spoke two weeks ago about the two on the road to Emmaus. That was the first recorded appearance of the risen Christ outside the closed circle of the apostles. In the 40 days before his ascension, Jesus would show himself in the presence of many. It wasn't, oh, I heard that Jesus appeared. Yeah, he, and he appeared over there as well. It was for the majority, for a lot of people, not the majority maybe, but a lot of people, it was, I have seen the risen Christ. That day, Ascension Day, 40 days after Easter, we celebrate the birthday of Christ's own church. Incidentally, on Ascension Sunday, we will add to the number of this church by welcoming five new members. This is a tradition in many churches to welcome new members to the body of Christ the church on that day. And Desert Chapel will keep that tradition alive. Some comment has been made recently that the church is not preaching a bit biblical message. Well, in this church, I believe I've done that. I hope I have. I hope that you have found some biblical context in what I preach. I don't pretend to be the world's greatest preacher or even close, but I do know my Bible fairly well and I preach Christ crucified and risen. The fact that a lot of churches are not preaching biblically I think is due to the fact that it can be a little bit disturbing or uncomfortable sometimes to preach the truth. A com this comment about not, that some of the, let's say, non-denominational churches not preaching a relevant message was made on, on radio by a, I think it was Bill O'Reilly, I'm not sure, but he made the comment that people were preaching a feel-good gospel. We want you to feel good about it. I was told when I began in ministry some 20 several years ago, <laughs> 25, 28 years ago, 
A preacher's job is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. I believe that. If you are comfortable in the way things are going, then I'm not doing my job because I need to make you think about what's really happening. A Christian life must be lived in order to be fulfilled. You can't just say, oh, I'm a Christian, I go to church on Sundays if there's nothing good on the TV. You know, that's not it. It's not a feel-good gospel. A 20th century German theologian who you may or may not have heard of by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, life is to be lived from the center, not at the center. The center of life is Jesus Christ. We are to live from the center, not at, we are not the center of our lives. Jesus Christ is the center of our lives. We are to live that way as if Christ is by our side because he is. Listening to me or any other preacher is not enough. Words must be acted upon. The message understood and the path to the Father explored and exploited. Have you ever come to a point in your life where you ask yourself, what now? Where do I go from here? Either out of desperation or hopelessness. We have a place to go for answers to such questions. We have an advocate. Jesus said, Ask in my name. You know, there are people that do that, sort of. But I remember going to a youth gathering somewhere. I don't remember exactly where it was when I first heard it. And everything, every prayer that was said during that time, it was, in Jesus' name we pray. It was an afterthought. There was nothing sincere about it. Okay, you said the words, but did you mean them? Did they work for you? Yeah, they worked for you, but are you sincere? In Jesus' name we pray is not asking in the name of Jesus. It's just going through a a ritual, if you like, that you've been doing for years. What better source for advice about a life lived in God than God himself through the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is, there are many names, paraclete, advocate, um, lost the others, but Anyway, there are lots of names for the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is there to guide us. To speak for us when we have no words. You ever in that situation where you want to say something but you just can't find the words? It doesn't matter what the situation is. And then you start to stumble and burble. (coughs) But stumbling and burbling is okay when you pray if if it's in your heart and you want to ask God for something and invoke the Holy Spirit to pray for you. And he will. When we don't know how to pray or ask, the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. That's another good word for the Holy Spirit, the intercessor. 
There is no need to say, I don't know how to say or how to, I don't know what to say or I don't know how to ask. God listens and God hears. Amen. I'm afraid I'm going to cough again, but I have a secret supply of cough sweets under here now. <laughs> if you will turn to page... No, we wanted, we got something else to do first, haven't we? I heard, I heard a murmuring that I was jumping ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. <laughs> um, Oh yeah, it's that important thing that pays the bills. Will the ushers come forward please and wait upon us for our tithes and offerings? God, accept the gifts we bring. Bless the givers, bless those unable to give. We ask that these gifts may be used for the work of your church, both here and around the world, that all may come to know the saving grace of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. you turn to page 15 in the hymnal, I know this is not the usual one we use, but that's the one we're going to use today. <laughs> um, about two-thirds of the way down the page where it says the great thanksgiving, we'll begin there. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift up your Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Right 
It is right to give our thanks and praise to God Almighty. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Before Jesus went to the cross for us, he knew what was going to happen. He knew that he was not going to live for another day. But he did it willingly. He gave his life willingly for all the people who would accept him as Lord and Savior. That is why we celebrate today. You know, it's not just a ritual that we do now once a month because Pardon me. It has a purpose. That's why we do it. To remind us that our God in Lord Jesus Christ came to earth for all of us and instituted this meal to make sure that we would remember him. I know for many of you, you have been in churches taking communion every Sunday or every other Sunday or once a month, and you could probably count over a thousand times. How hard would that be? Let's say you've taken communion for 50 years. That's 2,500 times. So it's not, I think that's right. Um, so you do it out of habit, yes, but you do it because you want to do it and because Jesus gave so much for you. And so in remembrance of your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, Lord, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. Christ, Christ has risen. Christ will come again. All honor and glory is yours, Father God, now and forever. Amen. Let us say together the prayer that Jesus gave us, taught us, and said, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us away from temptation. And for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We remember how on that night, 2,000 years ago, Jesus sat with his disciples and he took a loaf of bread from the table, nothing special, just an ordinary loaf of bread, about this size probably, and he broke it. And he said to the disciples, this is my body broken for you, at which point they all looked at each other and said, what? It's just a loaf of bread. No. Jesus made it something special. 
He said, do this as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. He used the Jewish prayer, which begins, Blessed are you, O God, who doth cause the earth to bring forth grain that we might have bread. I imagine there were many questioning faces around that table. And then when the meal was over, because it was all part of the Seder, there was one cup left on the table. Elijah's cup. And the tradition amongst the Jews was that if someone drank from that cup, then Elijah was present to bring forth the Lord. So Jesus took that cup. Normally no one touched it. He blessed it again, saying, Blessed are you, O God, who hath caused the earth to bring forth the grape that we might have wine. Then he passed it around to them and said, This is my blood of a new covenant for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it. Again, I imagine there were some shocked faces around the table because Jews don't drink animal blood. That's one of the things that kosher is all about. So they looked at it, looked at him and said, it's just wine right now. But you see, the whole thing about it is, when we take this in, <coughs> pardon me, when we take this in, it, it is for us, the body and blood of Christ. Now the Catholic Church believes that it actually is changed. It changes its format when we take it in. I don't see that. And we don't do that because we believe that as we take it in, it has for us that way of changing us because we take it in as the body and blood of Christ. So Jesus wanted to leave us with this memory of him. And churches have been doing this for 2,000 years. It's pretty durable, isn't it? Jesus did something for us that would remind us of who, who he was and why he came. So will the ushers come forward and distribute the elements? There is gluten-free and regular. When you get it, will you take the cover off the end with the bread in it, the wafer, and hold it until everyone has been served and then we will receive together.
body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat. forgiveness of sins drink you all from this Let us pray. Almighty God, you have fed us with this mystery. Lord, we do not believe that we can ever understand everything about you. You are mysterious, you are wonderful, you are beyond comprehension. But Lord, we know that you love us and we try so hard to love you in return. Thank you, Lord, for this gift and for all your gifts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One nine two one two one nine two one one nine, right? Our final hymn is Where the Spirit of the Lord is, 2119 in this small book. It's uh, not a very popular one for singing, but it's got so much meaning to it. Hint, hint, Michael. <laughs> Susie. <laughs> what, I wanted to say something about the music, you know. I am so thankful for Michael and Ryan and Susie. You know, we have a, we're small, but we have a mighty music program here, I think and the choir even sometimes too. I'm just so thankful for that. It's, 
I came from a church with a fairly large choir and I thought I was going to miss it, but we are small but mighty, right? Remember that as you go out into the world today, you are just an individual, but there is a whole company of those who worship the Lord. Bless you and keep you this week. And as they said on the old time radio stations, y'all come back next week. <laughs> okay? God bless you. Let's do this again. <laughs>